You're listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up! Podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. We are coming to you from the Vivid Seat Studio, and I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, my co-host, my partner in crime. You know him and love him as the lead NFL writer for Heavy.com. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, we are one day removed from the Broncos officially stacking one win on top of another. How are you feeling today, one day removed? I'm feeling optimistic for the fan base. I see all these tweets out there talking playoffs now and talking resurrection of the season. Might be a little too premature to see that, but in terms of what Broncos fans have been through the last couple years and to start this season with another losing streak, it's nice to at least see some some positive, some glowing vibes from Broncos country after an impressive victory. I published an article late Sunday that asked the question, are the Denver Broncos winning because of or in spite of Joe Flacco. And I'll tell you what, I got a lot of pushback from readers on, you know, some Broncos fans are pretty sensitive about Joe Flacco right now because, you know, on one hand, I knew when I was writing this article, Zach, that, you know, it's going to come off like I'm raining on the parade. We should be focusing on the positives. The Broncos just won two games in a row for the first time in what feels like forever. And they're climbing out of a four game hole that they, they opened up to start this season. And that's what we should be talking about. And yet, Joe Flacco was, has been so bad, Zach, over the last two games. I mean, the Broncos have, have in, in the last eight quarters of play, 25 third downs, okay, that they've come up across. Five conversions in the last 25 third down mm-hmm. attempts. And Joe Flacco, I'm sorry. I mean, we've talk, we talk about this a lot on the show. Third down efficiency is very much tied to quarterback play in terms of, I mean, connect the dots. And so I wrote that article, got a lot of pushback. But are we possibly, Zach, being too hard on Joe Flacco, you think? I don't think so. And, and color me shocked, Chad, that you got some blowback from the from the negative perceived reaction of Joe Flacco's performance. I've been there right along step side of you saying these things about Flacco that he is, again, he is not the only problem. He is not the the biggest problem, but he is not the answer. And he's done nothing in this offense. People talk about he's led some quote unquote game winning drives. even though They weren't game winning. Uh, he's an upgrade on Case Keenum. He, he has what it takes. Those are all until you see it, it's all in theory. It's it's all in practice. I want to see the results come out. I want to see him beat a dominant team. He goes out there on Thursday night chat. He outduels Patrick Mahomes. He throws four touchdowns, 400 yards. Yeah. Then I will start to say he's the answer to it and he's the solution, at least in that week. And at least he did something to spur a Broncos victory and, and not just get them over the hump or not just tread water. So, yeah, I don't think he's he's the reason why they're at right now, but he's, he did nothing to me to advance that record. He did nothing to me to move the needle. He did nothing to me to warrant sitting Drew Locke for the rest of the season and in keeping him as the, quote, understood quarterback. And that's just my opinion, and I think we share an opinion on that. I don't know where Broncos fans or why they're caping so hard for Joe Flacco. Is it recency? Is it wanting to have a quarterback that, that's been there and done that like a Peyton Manning? Are you yearning for those years again? I don't know why. He hasn't been overly impressive. He hasn't been god-awful, but he's just mediocre. To me, he's a jag, and uh, that's come out in the wash through you know six weeks. And statistically, he's basically a bottom eight quarterback in the NFL right now. So there's two things that Flacco said after the game at the podium that I want to touch on, and then we're going to talk to Seth Kaiser, our Behind Enemy Lines guest, of course, covering the Kansas City Chiefs for The Athletic. We're going to get to all that, but first, just a couple of quick matters of business, a reminder to everybody, make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. That's simply the best way for you to keep your finger on on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. Also head over to mybookie.ag if you want to get your first deposit matched 100% by mybookie. Go there, use the promo code OVERTIME. It'll take care of that business for you. And uh, you'll have a little extra cheddar to play with on game day. And then also make sure you go and leave a creative review. And if you like what you're hearing from us, a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. That does two things. One, it gets your foot in the door for the drawing and the giveaway each and every month. We're going to give away some Mile High Huddle, Huddle Up podcast swag to randomly selected reviewers off of Apple Podcasts. And it also is a great way to help support the show. 
This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, Zach, before we grab Seth, two things Joe Flacco said following the Titans' victory, 16-0 shutout from that defense, at the podium that jumped out to me, and I missed it on Sunday. It was actually going through and analyzing some of the quotes on Monday where this, this jumped out to me. But let me read these two quotes. First off, one, he says, quote, talking about whether or not a defense being that dominant, you know, how much easier does that make it on you, et cetera, et cetera. Quote, in some ways, it doesn't always make it easier. It's awesome to see them play like that. First of all, it's funny the way things go when a defense is playing that good. Sometimes as an offense, you kind of get in the mode of playing conservative, and then you kind of put yourself behind the sticks. A penalty here, a penalty there. In some ways, it makes us be more on top of our stuff and things like that. Close quote. Now, the other thing he said is that, so So. So he admits they're being a little bit conservative, or that he kind of went into a conservative shell mode type deal. The other thing he said here, let me find the quote. Quote, I think the one thing I would say is that you get a little less aggressive than maybe you should be just because you give them, the opponent, a lot of credit on the other side. I think when we really turn the corner and become a really good offense, we're not going to care really who we're facing. We're just going to go out there and we're going to do our thing the way we know how to do it. I would say that's kind of a little bit of what I felt today, close quote. So, Zach, what on one hand, let me just sum this up for our listeners. On one hand, he's admitting that, yeah, because we knew the defense was playing so well and they're, the points for the Titans were going to be really hard to come by, yeah, I kind of battened down the hatches a little bit as a quarterback. I didn't push the envelope at all. And then on the other hand, he's also saying that he was a little bit shook by the opponent. He feared the Titans secondary, which is really good. That front seven's good too, but the Titans secondary in particular, really good, which also affected him. Now, he says, at some point, you know, we're going to be good enough as an offense where it's not going to matter who we're facing. We don't really care, Zach. That's Patrick Mahomes. That's what you see. Patrick Mahomes goes into each and every matchup. He doesn't care who he's facing. Sure, he's going to study his opponent. He's going to recognize strengths. He's going to recognize weaknesses. But he's going to go out and play his game. Flacco, he can talk that game, but we're just not seeing it come to fruition in any way, shape, or form. I'm trying not to read too much into this quote or kind of misappropriate what he's saying here. I don't really like that mentality, though, from your starting quarterback who won a Super Bowl and was the MVP of that game. Basically, like you said, Chad, he's admitting the Broncos have been conservative. They've been a little east and west when they should have been north and south. But then to say that, oh, we'll finally turn it on when we get more comfortable, I want that confidence like Mahomes has, like you said, all the time, regardless. I don't care if you're going to the Patriots or I don't care if you're going to the Bengals. I want to go into every Sunday with the mentality and the attitude like you're going to win this game you're going to dominate this game on offense you're going to lead this team to victory it it, it shouldn't be contingent on anything or dependent on anything uh it, it really it shows the infancy in my opinion of this offense that we really over not oversold but maybe overrated how explosive or efficient they would be out of the gates between Scangarello finding his 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 wheels and his bearings and Flacco having some rust getting going and still still doing that, taking sacks and stuff, this offense was not a well-oiled machine, and it seems like they were really um, lacking confidence the first couple of weeks, almost like they were wandering blindfolded through the earth, and they just had no direction, nowhere to go, and no identity, and I'm glad they're starting to find that, but it shouldn't be contingent on winning. It shouldn't be contingent on the opponent. I want that all the time. I want that attitude and that swagger. Fake it until you make it. I mean, we've seen the last couple of years, the offense has been neutered by quarterback after quarterback, coach after coach. Where is the guy who's going to come in and just be that spark plug? Is it going to be Drew Locke? I think that's what the fans want to see, what they're not seeing from Flacco, that fire. We get so many comments, Chad, on the, the live streams that we do and, and on Twitter and, and yep. Facebook, everywhere else, that Flacco looks disinterested. He looks like an old man out there. He has no fire, no passion. Fans want to see that. They want to see him at homes. They want to see this excitement. And for him to admit that, it's the total opposite of that. And that's going to add more fuel to the Drew Locke bandwagon. And that's the thing, too. I want to just flip this coin for a second. And I don't want to completely take all credit away from Joe Flacco because the truth is, even though it hasn't been pretty, and I really don't think it's a sustainable model these last two games with the way the offense has played, he has done enough in these last two games to win. And you could even argue in those two games, the Jags game and the Bears game, he did enough to win that game as well if the defense can get one stop on that final possession of both those games. I don't want to completely crucify this guy. All I'm trying to say to everybody is I'm trying to be the guy, you know, waving my hand. And Zach, I'm, you're you're on board with me on this. Look, guys, you know, two games, two game winning streak. It's great. Let's celebrate that. It does feel good 
for the Broncos to have some wins and to stack one on top of the other, and we'll see if they can do three. We'll talk to Seth here in just a minute, but this is not a model that is sustainable. When you're playing a Titans team that's got a a melting down Marcus Mariota and a backup quarterback in Ryan Tannehill who has taken zero snaps all year, you can afford for your and your defense is playing lights out. You can afford for your quarterback to basically play in a shell the entire time. But that is not going to fly this week against Patrick Mahomes. And when it comes to Drew Locke, you know, I, I, this is another thing, Zach, and then we'll we'll touch on this and then we'll get to to Seth that I got from fans. It's like, well, what would you do? You think if, if Locke was on the roster right now, are you saying now's the time to play him? The Flacco's been that bad on the heels of two consecutive wins that you replace him today? And actually, that's not what I'm saying. In a, in a perfect world, and I recognize football is not a perfect world, And if I were making the decision, though, Zach, here's how it would shake out for me. The next three games before the bye, you got the Kansas City Chiefs on Thursday at home, then you got a road trip to take on the Colts, then you're home again against the Cleveland Browns, then you get your Week 10 bye. We'll see how that shakes out. But I would, A, absolutely and without fail, activate Drew Locke, barring some kind of unforeseen setback once he gets practicing again with that thumb. I would activate Drew Locke, make sure he's, he's ready to go on ice, if you will, on the sideline for what I'm about to say. Heading into Week 10, I mean, unless the Broncos literally go undefeated between now and then, heading into Week 10, I'm, I'm circling Week 10 as the get Drew Locke ready game. And in week 11, I'm rolling him out. I'm putting him out there because Joe Flacco is doing just enough. He's, he's basically playing not to lose quarterback right now. Okay, right. And again, against opponents like the Tennessee Titans and even opponents like the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I mean, it's more often than not, with how good this defense is, especially playing right now, that's, that's probably going to be enough to win those type of coin flip games. But against quality opponents like the Chiefs, or on the road against maybe a lesser explosive offense, but a quality opponent nonetheless on the road like the Indianapolis Colts, it's not going to cut the mustard. So I'm facing the reality of that today, and it's going to inform my decision-making moving forward, the first of which, Zach, is doing whatever I can to get Drew Locke out on the field, ready to go, activated on the sideline week nine, with an eye toward playing him week 11. Yeah, Chad, you bring up a really good point that I want to touch on. I'm sure I'll get blowback for this, too. But look at the two games the Broncos have won. Look at their opponents. Uh, the Chargers, they looked pretty awful against the Steelers. They're not. They're coming out to be not this uh, strong team like we saw the last couple years. And they beat a Titans team who was the antithesis of being impressive. They benched their starting quarterback for a, a retread journeyman in Tannehill. I don't think it's 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 overly impressive. It should be lauded. They they won two games in a row. They play good defense. But like I said, let Flacco come out on Thursday. Let him out duel Mahomes or at least keep up with Mahomes. And then I'll start to say they beat a quality opponent. Then I'll start to say Flacco um, out dueled and outplayed his counterpart. But until that happens, they're always going to be treading water and they're always going to be um, withering in big games against quality opponents and beating up on on smaller teams with with uh, weaker personnel. That's a schoolyard bully in the worst possible way. Not only that, but the the premise that, well, what, you just want to throw Drew Locke to the Wolves? You know, he's not ready. Today, he might not be ready. You know, they need to work him back into practice. They need to get him some reps. They need to get him going. Three, four weeks from now, it could very well be a different conversation. And Zach, look at what happened last year in Baltimore. Now, granted, Flacco got banged up. He got injured. Okay, he had that hip. But most fans, most most Ravens fans, I don't I don't know this for a fact, but I'd be willing to bet the majority of Ravens fans last year were like, whoa, wait a second, Flacco's our proven guy, and I know we just spent a first round pick on Lamar Jackson, but we're in the middle of the season here. We have a chance at the playoffs. This isn't the smartest thing to turn away from Flacco for this young guy, and yet they bit the bullet. They did what they had to do. They did what was was best for the team, not only in the short term but in the long term, and they ended up you know rallying galvanizing around Lamar Jackson, and the rest is history, okay? And that's what can happen. Now, does does that guarantee it would happen in Denver with Drew Locke? Not necessarily. But Joe Flacco, you guys, I ask you this. When your quarterback literally is producing at a bottom eight, bottom five to eight level, how much worse can it really get? Seriously, right. how much worse can you get? How What do you really have to lose at the quarterback level for the Denver Broncos? And that's really all I'm getting at here, Zach. 
It, it, like we always say, and, and it's a popular expression that applies to any player, but we've seen what we're going to see, I think, in Joe Flacco. We've seen his ceiling. We sure have seen his his prime. I think that's well past him. We haven't seen either of those things for Drew Locke. And the longer the Broncos go without knowing what they have in him, the longer they delay the inevitable, and the longer they stunt their growth of the future. And if they want that to start uh, getting off on the right foot and they want to be competitive starting next season and going forward, you got to see what you have in Drew Locke, even at the cost of your high paid quote-unquote understood franchise quarterback and not only that I mean look at what San Francisco is doing that's the model Mm. John Elway has I mean basically what the Niners are doing is Kyle Shanahan has recapitulated the vision that his father Mike Shanahan established in Denver all those years ago in just a little bit more of a new school sense offensively Rich Gangarello is trying to do the exact same things that the Niners are doing right now with Jimmy G at the helm you put a more dynamic quarterback back there. You put a guy there who not only has the arm talent, like Drew Locke does, but the athleticism to get out on the move, more effective, more believable on the on the boots. You can get some read options going. There's so many different things you could do with a more dynamic quarterback than what Joe Flacco at this stage in his career allows you to do. But I think we've kind of flogged this horse to death, no pun intended. <laughs> Let's take our only break of the day, and on the other side, we'll get Seth Kaiser on the horn, and we'll see what he has to say about this Broncos-Chiefs matchup in Week 7 on Thursday Night Football. We'll be right back. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. <laughs> and joining us now is the one, the only. You guys, by this point, know him well. He is Seth Kaiser. Seth, how you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty well. You know, it's been a it's been an interesting last uh, couple of days on Chiefs Twitter. But other than that, I uh, <laughs> life is good. Before we uh, we hit the record button, you were talking about an article that you had written on Monday about your Chiefs. And by the way, just to recap for anyone who's missed it, the Chiefs are on a rare two game losing streak here with Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid at the helm. So. Tell us about this article you said that might have gotten a little bit of uh, a reaction from Chiefs Kingdom. Sure. So, I mean, in terms of of this season, I tend to be someone who, you know, after six games, it's a little early to call anything. After four games, we were wondering if the Chiefs were going to break a bunch of all-time scoring records. Two games later, it's a little early to say, oh, they're not even a playoff contender. There are a lot of people saying they're going to be eight and eight, all this stuff, right? However, I do think certain things about the team – can be evidenced in a few games that can at least make you ask a few tough questions. And so the question that I've asked is, is it time to start asking questions about uh, Brett Veach's overarching vision for the team? Hmm. And, you know, kind of taking a look at some of his big swings and asking ourselves whether or not he's hit as much as he's missed with those big swings. Because the reality is, with roster construction, every team misses, And every team even has a few big misses, right? I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. Football is not predictive. It's just not, generally speaking, especially with, like, cornerback play and things like that. You know, Chris Harris Jr. is an exception, but most corners vary wildly in their play from year to year. And and so it's tough to predict stuff. But So everyone's going to get stuff wrong. But the thing that I wrote about, I was kind of focusing on the fact that when you look at the biggest moves that Brett Veach has made, trading Alex Smith, which obviously Mahomes needed to start, but with Kendall Fuller being kind of like the prize jewel from that trade, and he's been good, but not that good. He's been good, but not great. Um, signing Anthony Hitchens, signing Sammy Watkins, si- signing Tyron Matthew, and then then trading for and signing Frank Clark to a big deal. If you look at all of those things and – it appears that they viewed every one of those guys as like foundational pieces, right? I mean, they, the way they talked about Kendall Fuller, they thought he was a foundational piece. Yeah. Same with Hitchens, same with Watkins. I would argue of all of them, the only one that's played like a truly foundational piece has been Matthew so far. He's done really well. Yeah. But everyone else, uh, that's tough. And when you're missing that consistently, now there's plenty of time for Frank Clark, obviously. We're talking six games in, and he's been really good for a while. But you you start to wonder, you know, what would this roster look like without Patrick Mahomes playing at a at a high level? And I think we've seen with his ankle dinged up the last couple of weeks that when Mahomes isn't in demigod mode, <laughs> there are some real flaws with the roster. Now, then the flip side of that, because I always try to argue both sides with such things, is they've got a lot of walking wounded right now. 
and it's awfully early to make those distinctions because let's face it, let's say let's say they manage to somehow beat Denver and then they reel off four or five in a row. No one's going to even care about these losses right. in six weeks. It's true. So that, that's just how it goes. But it's fun. We were talking about you know every week in the NFL is like an event. Yeah. So it causes us to overreact both ways, which, by the way, speaking of streaks, I think Denver's <laughs> won like eight in a row or whatever it is now. <laughs> That's how it feels, man, because there's been some dark days in Denver since Super Bowl 50, and when you can string two together, man, I mean, that feels like <laughs> Super Bowl 50 all over again. But is that what you attribute really then to this this two-game kind of backslide a little bit, which I think most of us paying attention, it, it feels like it's a temporary step backward with Patrick Mahomes, but do you – do you attribute that to the ankle? I attribute it to kind of a perfect storm of things. So they, they've got some injuries, and injuries aren't an excuse, right? Every team deals with injuries, but their injuries have been kind of weird ones and ones that are sort of symbiotic with one another in, that, in, in like the worst way possible, right? So, you know, week one, Mahomes dings his ankle up. Um, you know, week two, they lose, <clears throat> they lose Eric Fisher. Week one, they lose Tyreek Hill. Now, Eric Fisher is not a great player. Denver fans are very familiar with him, but he's also not a he's, he's a decent left tackle. Yeah. You can leave him on his own. He's a good run blocker. And one on one, he does all right against elite competition. He can suffer, but he can still hold his own most of the time. Well, to, from go to go from that to Cam Irving is tough, mm-hmm. right? And so you have that, and then you have Mahomes with a dinged up ankle, which makes him not quite as mobile, not quite as accurate. Um, that's been the real thing. It's not that he's not running around okay. It's when he plants and throws, you can tell he's uncomfortable, and it's really affecting his velocity and accuracy, right? Mm. And so then you combine that with missing Tyreek Hill, who was on a, a snap count against Houston. And if, I don't know if you guys watched the game, but there was such a clear difference in, in the offense with oh, yeah. him on the field mm-hmm. that versus down. off the field. Unbelievable. That was <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a good – people just talk about him like he's just a fast guy. But his ball skills are are just stupid. And he's just a playmaker, um, man. He's just an explosive impact yep. guy. Absolutely. And and their offense is predicated on that. Andy Reid kind of shifted the offense again this year, and they clearly want to be a very, very vertical attack team. Um, and, and they've every year they've moved more towards that. And then this year I think they planned on being like what – people saw like they've been fully healthy for like one half of football this year and that's when they were like it was like bombs away against the Jags in week one and I think that's what they want to be but they they lost a lot of that by losing Hill and then with Watkins being out as well it, it's just been tough and all those things work together symbiotically to make the offense a lot more inconsistent I think if any one of those things were different the offense would have still looked better than it has the last couple of weeks. Like, you know, if, Ank- if, if Mahomes' ankle weren't tweaked, I think is the biggest one, then, yeah, we'd probably see him running around and making plays like a weird, you know, metahuman. Or if Fisher were still in, the pass blocking would be better. Or if Hill and Watkins had been both healthy, like fully healthy, well, you can do a lot more short passes because they can get separation more quickly. So I do think it's a temporary thing due to injuries, but it, it's discouraging because... I think Chiefs fans very quickly kind of fell into this idea that the offense was always going to look unstoppable. And Seth, I want to kind of shift gears to the defensive side now because if the Broncos have any shot of winning this game, they're going to at least have to match scores or keep up with the KC offense on some level. Uh, the Chiefs switch coordinators that they talked about and banded about having a new scheme and, and having uh, Frank Clark there now. Have you noticed a big improvement? What's the, the, the strength of the Kansas City defense from a Broncos fan's point of view listening to this podcast? And what would you say? Uh, it- <laughs> I'm not Fair sure. Enough. I'm not sure. I'm familiar with that word strength. Is Fair that enough. like? Is that like a weakness but different? <laughs> um. So okay. Here, here's here's the, the the long and short of it. Um. Their pet. Their their secondary, which was supposed to be the big issue, has actually been been all right. Their safety play has been really good. Juan Thornhill has played kind of the overtop safety role. He's done a really good job. Tyron Matthew has played well. Um, the, the corners have been surprisingly competent the last few weeks. Um, not great. And they don't have a true number one guy back there, which matters, but they've been all right. Um, the, the concerning part has been the pass rush, especially Chris Jones is out with an injury. And I think you guys as Broncos fans are familiar with his work. Oh yes. Um, he is, he, he's a monster and 
having him out there, their pass rush was just stagnant against a Texans team that normally really struggles to protect the passer. Now they haven't, you know, they is like similar to against Atlanta. They just they didn't they didn't sack him once. Frank Clark has been he's been all right. But he hasn't been what they'd hoped he'd be. He hasn't been as good as he was in Seattle. So they, but their linebacker play is when they've just been abysmal, um, just awful. Uh, they've been awful against the run, which normally, you know, if you look at the analytics and all that, blah, blah, blah stuff, it doesn't matter that much, like as much as pass defense. But when you're super awful at it, it matters a little, especially when the offense is struggling a bit. And so that's been the defense has been pretty rough. I would say it is better than it was last year. But remember, last year was one of the worst defenses that the NFL has seen in a while. So it's kind of like the, the 2013 Broncos defense. <laughs> Very similar. Very similar. You know, uh, sometimes I forget what it's like to talk to you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it just it, it's just it, it's not a good defense right now. Um, they, they, they've been missing tackles. The linebackers in particular have been bad against the pass and the run. Um, the defensive front has not looked particularly good. They looked pretty good for like through the first four weeks. So I think they might pull it together, but missing Chris Jones has been big. And so, I mean, if I'm the Broncos, I look at the, you know, the Broncos have a solid rushing attack. Uh, I would look at what teams have done and Fangio's defense seems to have really pulled it together after kind of a tough start. Um, and I would say, look, we're going to try to dominate time of possession to where we can limit this game to as few possessions as possible and kind of, you know, make it to where you're not in some kind of shootout. And then just hopefully just control the ball at the end of the half and the end of the game and have that be enough. Um, and I think it could be because there, there's a there's a legitimate chance the Broncos rush for 200 yards on the Chiefs. That's the only thing the, the Broncos really have going right now offensively is a relatively potent one two rushing attack and a defense that's finally started to kind of find itself and everything that Fangio has been installing finally starting to click a little bit and for guys like us you know we've been covering a lot of bad dating back now is you know three years basically and at times it can become myopic and I think anyone who covers a team can relate to this from the outside looking in the Denver Broncos open up 0-4 very easily could have been two and two had a couple of small things not gone the way they had gone for the Broncos. A couple of questionable calls by refs, one of which the NFL admitted they got wrong. Neither here nor there. This team could be four and two, though, is what I'm getting at. They turn around out of zero and four, win two in a row. What's the view of this Denver Broncos team from you know a town like Kansas City, who's who's beaten Denver now seven games, seven matchups in a row? Has it been seven? Seven dates back to week two. Of 2015, when Jamal Charles fumbles and Rosen okay. scoops it up. Okay, <laughs> I was at that game. Um, that was that was it. That was that was the Eric Berry returns game. Um, no, it, so the view of Denver and like this is just this isn't smack talk. This is no, just how true. it is. They they've played they they played Kansas City pretty tough a few times. Um, you know, last year the first you know that Monday Night Football thing obviously required a Mahomes miracle. Um. And 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 then the next game wasn't quite as close. And and so I think the big thing in terms of with, with the Broncos, there's a little bit of unfamiliarity there right now for Chiefs fans because they're under new management, as right, it were. Right. Um new quarterback I, too. Yep, new quarterback. I was very disappointed that they parted with uh with Vance. I uh I was kinda hoping he'd stick around I'm in sure Denver for ten years. Um you know, the the big thing with, with Denver is that the, the 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 general vibe with Chiefs fans and and with myself is that you know with the Chiefs fully healthy I think they are a, a, a more talented team and I think the 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 chasm between Mahomes and Flacco is so great that it's tough to view them as a as a legitimate threat yeah. in terms of like winning the division but in terms of being an opponent that'll be tough to beat I think Denver's style of play is is going to be tough. For Kansas City, I think it's a tough matchup, especially right now as they continue to kind of slog through injuries. Um, so I think that's kind of the idea is that, that Denver, because they have beaten them quite a few times in a row, they're kind of viewed as a little less dangerous right now than maybe they once were. Oh, yeah. But I mean, all it takes is one is one win to cha- to turn that around for Denver. 
Now, Seth, I'd like to ask every guest, just to get like a behind enemy lines perspective, like wh- I, you probably already answered this, and I know you have, speaking of Mahomes, speaking of the, the Chiefs' run defense, but what's one reason you would see the Chiefs losing this game, and what's one reason you see the Chiefs winning this game? Again, the answers are probably obvious, but sure. if you can just expound on that a little more. Um, the, the biggest reason I see the Chiefs losing the game, and, and again, this isn't, this isn't, I, you know, I, sometimes I'm kind of a villain to Broncos fans because I like to do friendly smack talk. The ones with good senses of humor know that it's friendly. So if you ever see me talking smack on Twitter, <laughs> I promise I'm doing it with a smile. This is all more fun when we can talk a little trash oh, in yeah. a respectful way. Um, and what I mean in, in the nicest possible, I think the Chiefs more do need to kind of beat themselves a little bit in terms of on offense, at least. Because that's the only times I've seen them really slowed down, uh, e- including you know the indie game when you've got fumbles or where you've got drop passes or where you got Mahomes looking a little shaky. That those are the only time I've seen the Chiefs slow down, whether it's against the the, the Broncos, the Jags, the Ravens, even the Patriots, right? Mm. So I think the biggest thing will be if the Chiefs' offense continues to sputter, that will allow the Broncos to win with the run. If the Chiefs offense is firing on all cylinders beating them with the run game is a sucker's bet because the run game just isn't efficient enough to keep up but if if the if the chiefs offense struggles and by struggles i don't mean like you know like like they did against indy but even against houston where they're kind of inconsistent that would be enough for them to kind of dominate the tempo of the game and have that actually matter like for example oakland dominated the tempo of the game by and large in week two and it just didn't matter because in the second quarter, it was like, hey, let's throw for like, you know, 18 touchdowns. And <laughs> yeah. that, that's, that was like the happy Gilmore. That was like the happy Gilmore. That was so much easier than putting. Like, <laughs> right. you know, we should just throw it in for 50 yards out every time. Yeah. You know, why don't they make the entire plane out of 50 yard touchdown? <laughs> and so and so I think that is why the Chiefs could lose if their offense struggles again. And, you know, um, I don't think Mahomes. Yeah, because they didn't play the Bears last year. Mahomes has never faced Fangio. No, and so and and Fangio's coverages are weird. They're legitimately weird. I, I was looking at a little film, and I can't ID what he's using. Like I'm like, is that cover six? Right. Like what is he doing? And it's so lots of zone. I, I was, yeah, lots of zone. Now zone is not always a great idea against the Chiefs. Um, that's, I was gonna. I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. we hear a lot about that. I'm sure Broncos fans, you know, that Mahomes is the zone killer. So expound on that. Sure. And so, you know, there's been a lot of ado about Mahomes being worse against man than zone this year. I, I do think that's been a little bit overwrought because those also happen to be the games where both Watkins and Hill and Fisher were all out and Mahomes was hobbled. It's like, well, yes, it's a lot easier to play straight man coverage against Demarcus Robinson and McCole Hardman than Tyreek Hill and Sammy Watkins. Um, and so that was partly a personnel thing, but really the chiefs receivers don't always do as well against super physical coverage, except Hill. He does fine with it, but everyone else it's, it's back and forth, including Watkins. Um, and playing Andy Reed's teams with zone coverage is tough because Andy Reed's seen it all, right? He's seen every type of zone coverage, and so he he always has the route combos to beat whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And so it's just a matter of a quarterback who can stay cool post-snap and see the openings, and generally speaking, Mahomes does. Yeah. So zone is not has not worked well against them traditionally. Um, but again, on the bum ankle, it might. So... That that that's that's something to keep an eye on, definitely, because the Broncos last year, when they gave Mahomes problems, you know, they were still under Vance at that point. They were playing a lot of man across the board and playing really physical yep. and relying on Chris Harris Jr. to to at times take away Kelsey, especially, and and it worked. So I, it'll be interesting because Fangio approaches it so differently. And that, so that'll be an interesting matchup and kind of a tough one for the Chiefs to get back on track. I think a lot is going to rise and fall on Mahomes' ankle. Yeah. Well, one more for you, brother, and then we'll cut you loose. I know it's early, but at the end of the day, it's a short week, short turnaround. So yeah. what's your prediction for Week 7 Broncos Chiefs in Denver? Right. Um, you know, I, I always hesitate to give actual scores. There, there's, there's very little about this game that would surprise me. Just because you know the Chiefs have struggled a little bit, and the Broncos, I think, have a very good defense. Um, I think Hill played about half the snaps Sunday, and all word is that he felt really good afterward. 
So I'm guessing he plays more snaps, and I think that's going to play a really important role because as as good as Denver's defense is, they, like most teams, they just don't have anyone that can that can lock him up one-on-one because he's just too fast. He just, he's just running around like the freaking Flash out there. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And so I, I think my prediction is I, I can't remember the last time I watched an Andy Reid coach team lose three in a row. Um, oh, yeah, you know, it was back when they, they they went one and five and then they had the turnaround and all that. They just – Reed is not an easy coach to beat three times in a row. And so I, I think the Chiefs will be able to bounce back from this. And now playing on the road on Thursday night is always tough. Um, and so I, I think it will be a really tight one. I think it's going to fall on Mahomes' ankle, I, but I do think it will be just good enough for him to conjure up a little bit of wizardry. Mm-hmm. And I see the Chiefs pulling it out. I'm going to say 27 to 24. Okay. That's fair. You guys heard it first here from Seth Kaiser. He covers the Kansas City Chiefs for The Athletic. Great friend of the show. Seth, thanks for making some time for us here tonight, brother. And uh, we'll talk to you, I don't know, a couple more weeks down the road when they meet at Arrowhead. Absolutely. At that point, you may be uh, willing to use my words against me in this call. (laughs) Hey, remember when you thought you guys would win? So it'll be fun. All right, man. Hey, find him on Twitter at... Let's see. Let me spell this out for people. Real MN Chiefs fan. MN short, of course, for Minnesota. At Real MN Chiefs fan. Always a great follow. Seth, thank you very much. We will talk to you here in just a couple of weeks. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, Zach. Great conversation with Seth. Always great talking to him, as always. We had to be a little bit shorter, a little bit more pithy in this particular conversation because Seth was able to uh, get on the horn with us on short notice, and so he was a little bit limited time-wise. But Zach, what jumps out to you in terms of what Seth had to say about kind of the state of what's going on in Kansas City with the two-game losing streak? He he kind of just is, I mean, all due respect to him, and this is not a slight, he's pretty much chalking it up to injuries. Right, and it's just a a kind of an exception. It's kind of been a weird case where an Andy Reid coach team has a losing streak. It it seems like also, based on what I'm feeling out from Seth, he thinks the Chiefs are going to win this game, but kind of eke by, and it's going to be maybe a sloppy game or maybe not their finest performance, but I think he thinks Mahomes will get it done. I kind of think the same. I think the Broncos will be competitive, but as he kind of intimated, the Chiefs are entirely beatable this year. There's been injuries. There's been underperforming defensive players. Even Mahomes has been off his game at times. The the all knowing and all great Mahomes, he is beatable. The Broncos came close last year and heading into this game, the Broncos are riding high, the Chiefs theoretically are riding low and that, you know, it's at home in Denver that would spell a positive for the Broncos. I tend to think though the Chiefs are going to be really pissed off in this game and the Broncos might be riding a little too high and then, you know, they they get overtaken by Mahomes. But it, it's interesting to see Seth's point of view that they're entirely beatable, they're fallible and uh, if things break a certain way, you might see a three-game Broncos winning streak. I'm just really curious to see which side the law of averages is going to favor here because on the Broncos' side, they've lost seven in a row against the Chiefs. At some point, something's got to give, right? I mean, it's it's a rare thing for a division opponent to have that sustained level of success against you know a, a familiar foe. Broncos had a, a streak like that during Peyton Manning, but eventually it cracked. You know, any given Sunday, you, you never know what's going to happen, and that came later on in the season in 2015, and and the Chiefs have never looked back. Meanwhile, so that there's a law of averages that you think, well, something's got to give. That could favor the Broncos. On the other side, the law of averages, as Seth pointed out, is how often do you see an Andy Reid-led team, especially with an elite quarterback, lose three in a row? I mean, two in a row is one thing. Three in a row? It's it's curious. So the unstoppable force is going to be is going to meet the immovable object here, for lack of a better phrase. And I'm really curious to see which which side this particular law of average is going to end up favoring. But something in my gut tells me the Broncos are onto something. I, as we've talked about a lot today, I have my doubts that they're going to be able to hang offensively with the way Joe Flacco is playing. But I think I think, and you could kind of hear it in Seth in what he was saying, not just in the the actual words he used, but the tonality. He's he doesn't know what to expect from Vic Fangio, and I think the Chiefs feel the exact same way. And if you look back to last year when the Chiefs, or excuse me, when the Bears took on the L.A. Rams, now that game was in Chicago, and the Rams were just beating up on everybody they came across, and and they played the Bears, and Fangio limited them to, at the time, what the lowest scoring output in in the Sean McVay head coaching tenure, which was six points, and completely made Jared Goff just look 
average or below average and and the bears won that game now i'm not predicting a you know that the, that he's going to be able to fangio duplicate that with patrick mahomes but i think he's going to be able to throw some things at this guy that he hasn't seen yet and i'm going to be really curious to see how that how that shakes out it's an interesting point that I hadn't really considered that the Broncos have plenty of tape on Mahomes, but the the Chiefs really have no tape of a Broncos coached uh, Fangio team working against them, and they have Vance Joseph to draw on, and their defenses are entirely different. It could be the the biggest benefactor for Denver is having the game at home and having Vic Fangio's defense on their side, and they're starting to click now with all the pieces coming together. I have no or little doubt, I should say, that Fangio's defense can hold Mahomes to 21 or 24 points. The doubt comes in, do I have faith that Flacco's going to have 21 or 24 points? Can the offense match that total or exceed that total to win the game? It's going to come down entirely to the offense, entirely on Flacco's shoulders. And if he wants to separate himself, if he wants to hold off Drew Locke, if he wants to be and help the Broncos be a playoff team, he literally has to step up in this game and take the game by force on the strength of his arm, go out there and win one, get the Broncos back uh, to a three-game winning streak now. All right, guys. Great conversation, though, with Seth. As always, we, we enjoy having him. Make sure you follow him on Twitter, at RealMNChiefsFan. But, you guys, that's going to do it for today. The next podcast you're going to get is the Scouts Eye Preview ahead of Broncos Chiefs. That's going to come next. And then Zach and I are going to return on – I think we're going to do it uh, – we talked about it, Zach. We're going to do our YouTube slash Facebook live simulcast – Normally we would wait to do that on uh, Thursday night, but being that this game is on Thursday night, we're going to be doing the Mile High Mailbag on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. And then, of course, gut reaction will will come immediately following Broncos Chiefs. So stay tuned for that. Those of you on YouTube and Facebook who want to join us live for those simulcasts, get your questions in, get your comments in, all that. Circle it on your calendar. Put a reminder in your phone, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m., Eastern Wednesday evening. But in the meantime, make sure you're following the show on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. That is simply the best way to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with this show in real time. Zach at Kelberman NFL, myself at Chad and Jensen. Stay tuned. We'll be back uh, in the saddle here day after tomorrow. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you then. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.